test part of the lecture, we are expanding now to thinking about what if we had three systems. So I've got a system one, a system two, and a system three. In the scenario of system, system one, and they're kind of running an example here, we've got a call center, callers come in, there is a selection process where they indicate whether they need to speak to billing or support, and then they get routed to billing and support. And billing might be staffed by three operators and support staffed by four operators. Now, the caller had to wait in caller selection to go through this, and then on top of that, uh, it may be that 41% of the callers go to billing and 59% go to support, but the proportion of support operators to billing operators don't quite match that. And so you might end up getting a case where you end up getting idle billing operators while all of your support operators are busy and you end up getting queues of uh, callers waiting in support that could go to billing if only billing could do the support tasks. And so the rationale is well, maybe we could cross train. And if you cross train all seven operators, then to do both billing and support, you can get rid of this caller selection, which uh, reduces the amount of time the caller spends in the system. And uh, on top of that, if in, whereas in this case, you had idle operators while customers were queuing, that wouldn't happen here. Because if customers start queuing, they could just get routed to another operator and be confident that the operator could do either job. Now, what may, uh, you may end up thinking is that, well, since I've actually ended up reducing the wait time here, uh, and I've sort of had a better utilization of my operators, then it's possible that I don't actually even need to staff all seven operators, that I might be able to get away with six operators. And so now you've, you're, you want to test whether cross-training makes uh, a difference and whether the number of operators makes a difference and which one is better. Now, what we mean by better might be complicated. So it might be that we notice a significant improvement in performance when we go to seven operators, but when we go to six operators, there's no difference in performance between system three and system one, um, but system three is much cheaper to implement because we only have six operators. And so in some cases, the performance was better with system two, but the cost was better with system three. And so, uh, you know, so which system is better is unclear, but what is clear is that in order for you to make any sort of judgment about that, you need a way to be able to compare the statistical outputs from these systems. So all three systems will generate data like this, so you might have different numbers of replicates for all three systems, uh, different um, you know, variances for all three system systems, you get a mean out of each system and a variance out of each system, and then you have to make uh, some sort of comparison of them. And so you want to see different ways to do that and how it differs slightly and yet also builds upon the pairwise comparisons that we've been doing so far. With the pairwise comparisons we've been doing, if you compare system one to system two, there's always a chance that the systems are equal, but you end up detecting a difference. You detect that one system is better than another, and we refer to that as the type one error rate, or alpha. Now, if you implement a test of three groups, and you do that by building it up, from pairwise tests, so comparing one to two, two to three, and one to three, then the issue is that your type one error for the family of comparison tests kind of adds up. And so if, if your null hypothesis is that there is no difference among all of the systems, and you detect a single difference in one of your many pairwise comparisons, then is it legal to say that you've detected a difference among all of the systems, or did you just get lucky because, or I guess unlucky, depending on your perspective, because if, uh, if you've got multiple comparisons and each one of them can be wrong 5% of the time, then if you do a lot of those, then eventually you're going to get one comparison that's wrong. If you, if you compared a hundred systems that way, then five of your comparisons will end up having the wrong outcomes. So if we care about the type one error rate for the entire family, we need to adjust the type one error rate for each individual pairwise comparison. And we would like to, uh, to adjust our comparison strategy so we don't end up needing to run a whole lot of simulations of all from every different system. So if I were to go back to this example here, what I might end up finding is that system two and system three are both a lot better than system one, 
um, because neither of them have the caller selection. So I might do one test where I run all three systems and I determine that two and three are clearly better than one, but I can't tell the difference between two or three. So then I run another set of comparisons just on two and three to figure out which one's better, two or three. And we need to make sure that we're doing that in a statistically rigorous way. All right, so how could we compare these systems? Well, one simple approach is to create a benchmark design. So that benchmark design could be you know, the original system and then you're comparing your two novel systems to the original system to see if they have an improvement. Or your benchmark design, um, like I mentioned in this other case, could be system two, where system two is a system where we know that you know we've got seven operators who've so got the same you know amount of resource here but we've also streamlined other parts of the system so we're pretty confident that system two is going to be better but we also know it's going to be more costly and so we actually really want to see is system three the same as system one because if three and one have equal performance and we were originally okay with one then we're actually going to go with system three because it's cheaper so um, there's different ways in which you could compare these three systems and choose different benchmarks. But the general idea here is we're going to say whatever system one is, that's our benchmark design. And we are going to compare all of the other k minus one. So in this case, if it's three systems total, all the other two systems to system one. And so we can create a confidence interval, which is a representation of the difference between our system of interest and system one, and then we can say, does zero exist in that confidence interval? If it does, then we're going to conclude that there's not a noticeable difference between the systems, and if zero is outside the confidence interval, we can conclude one is better than the other, depending on whether zero is greater than the confidence interval or zero is less than the confidence interval. So that will give us k minus one comparisons, and each one of them is a separate type hypothesis test with its own type one error rate. So if we think about the family, where we are just trying to detect whether there is any difference among uh, you know, all three systems, then the null hypothesis is that there's no difference, and the error would be detecting any difference. And so the error rate for the family is this interpretation. So if we talk about alpha for the family, that's probability of detecting any differences given that there are no differences. And that alpha is going to be built up from the alphas that go into these individual tests and we need to figure out what that mapping is in order for this alpha to be what we want it to be because this is the alpha we actually care about but these are the alphas we have control over. Approach two, a different approach to comparing systems where we compare every system to every other system and we just do all pairwise comparisons one to two, two to three, one to three. And so once we compare all of them then we might get a ranking out. We might find that one is clearly better than three, three is clearly better than two, and if uh, and then we might end up finding, if we compare one directly to two, that one is also better than two, and then we have confidence that we can rank them one, two, and three. But we might get some of the rankings wrong, you know, because each one of those rankings has a type one error rate. If we get the rankings right, we can select the system with the best ranking. So in this case, we don't have k comparisons, we have k times k minus 1 over 2 comparisons. So as the number of systems gets large, the number of comparison grows like k squared. So you end up getting a lot of comparisons. And so there's a lot of opportunity to make one of these type 1 errors at each individual comparison. So um, the alpha that we care about is under the null hypothesis that all the systems are equivalent. What is the probability that we detect some ordering? some order uh, among them, some ranking. And so that is our alpha. And so this is the thing that we end up wanting to set as you know, 5%. But in order to do that, we need to configure the alpha Cs for each pairwise comparison to make sure that that happens correctly. So this fits into what statisticians call the general problem, the multiple comparisons problem. And the idea behind multiple comparisons is if I have um, capital C number of comparisons, each comparison is going to have its own type 1 error rate. And so um, what, I'm, what I'm saying with that is the, the probability 1 minus that is the probability that identical systems actually come out identical. So the error is when they are identical, they come out looking different. And so 
if I'm wonder, worried about the probability that at least one of those tests detects a false difference, that's just one minus the probability that none of them detect a false difference. And so remember, one minus alpha c is that, that is the probability that test c got it right. And so if I assume all of them got it right, it's just the product of one minus alpha c, and then one minus that is the probability that at least one of them got it wrong. And so if we choose alpha c equal to alpha, where alpha is our desired type 1 error rate for the family, then we end up getting this error where um, I just plugged alpha c into um, alpha into this alpha c, and that's what I got here, and then I just get 1 minus 1 minus alpha to the capital C. And if c is equal to 1, then this is exactly equal to alpha. So if you do one comparison, then of course that makes sense. It degenerates into the nice, you know, exactly what we were expecting. But as c gets larger, then this number here grows. It grows, it's uh, closer and closer to 1. So eventually, if you have lots and lots of comparisons, then that means that your family's type 1 error rate is going to be equal to 1, which just means that that if all of the systems are equal in the previous two examples that I gave, there's a 100% chance that you're going to detect a difference when it's not actually there. So, um, you know, the other way to think of it is if, um, if each individual pairwise comparison is a weighted coin that you flip and 95% comes up heads, if you flip a lot of those coins, there's a 100% probability that one of them is going to come up tails. So, uh, the family type 1 error rate is always going to be greater than the individual type 1 error rate, and so we need to reduce the individual type 1 error rate in order to get our family type 1 error rate in the range that we actually want. And so this is the so-called Bonferroni approach to that. It's a very conservative approach, and it comes from observing that the probability of detecting one or more false differences is always going to be less than this bound. It's just the sum of all the type 1 error rates. And so this is, like I say, a conservative bound. And so based on that assumption, then we say we can bound the type 1 error rate for the family by setting alpha c um, not equal to alpha, but equal to alpha divided by capital C. And if you set alpha c equal to alpha divided by capital C, and then you calculate this sum, then it just turns into alpha. And so that guarantees that the probability of detecting one or more false differences is less than or equal to your actual type 1 error rate that you want for the whole family. So your true type 1 error rate is definitely going to be less than alpha, but it's definitely, but it's not ever going to be worse than alpha. So again, it's conservative. So we're actually cranking our type 1 error rate down lower than we need it by applying the Bonferroni approach. And that's one of the reasons why we'd like to avoid the Bonferroni whenever we can, but sometimes we can't, or sometimes it's just the easiest thing or the most practical thing to do. The other caveat behind the Bonferroni approach is just think about what's happening to the individual alpha C's. If you, as you get more and more comparisons, the individual alpha C's get smaller and smaller and smaller, and so the confidence intervals associated with those alpha C's for all those individual pairwise comparisons get larger and larger and larger. And so as the confidence intervals for each one of those individual tests grow larger, you stop rejecting um, hypotheses. In other words, you stop noticing when things are different. And so although you are preserving the type 1 error rate of the family, you are massively destroying your statistical power. In other words, if, you, if now in this new Bonferroni test, if you don't detect a difference, um, then you can't really say anything if you have a whole lot of comparisons. So just imagine if, if I flip a thousand coins and I have engineered the... Um, if I've engineered the test so that uh, I very, very rarely, um, if, I've, if I engineer the family test so that I very, very rarely get a false detection, even though I've tried to get a false detection thousands of times, then that means that the failure to detect something doesn't actually mean that there's nothing there to detect. It just means that I have a very, very weak test. So this that's what Bonferroni does, is it weakens the individual tests in order for to 
to sort of control the strength of the family test, but it does that at the cost of reducing statistical power. The alternative, which is always the better alternative to do in you know, general uh, statistical methods, and we'll talk about for simulation how this is a little different, but for generally when you've got real data, um, an, an ANOVA is always going to be much better than a Bonferroni approach. An ANOVA does exactly the same thing. So I've got multiple groups, system A, B, C, and I want to know is there an effect of the system type. So system A, you know, um, a more conventional way that, you know, in IE380, it might be that system A is the, the plant in, in Minneapolis, system B is the plant in Columbus, and system C is the plant in New York. And we want to see if there's any geographical differences in performance across these. And so we take a performance measure from Minneapolis, from Columbus, and New York. We throw those into an ANOVA, and we say, ANOVA, is there any difference between these? And the ANOVA might come out and say, I, they say that it cannot detect an effect of geographical location. In other words, you've given it three data sets, and it can't tell that those three data sets came from a different um, uh, from a different population. And so, and it manages to do that without doing multiple pairwise comparisons. It's a one comparison method, and that actually gives it a great deal more statistical power, which is one of the reasons why you trust an ANOVA when it doesn't find a difference. Whereas, if you do a bunch of Bonferroni comparisons and you don't find a difference, you just don't really trust it that much. Now, um, once the ANOVA says there's a difference, that's not enough to conclude just from looking at the means. Uh, which one's better than, than which. Uh, so in order to, to be absolutely sure um, you know, where the differences are, once you're sure the ANOVA comes out detecting a difference, you run a so-called post hoc test. The common ones you'd see in the sciences are the Tukey test. The common one you'd see in engineering is Fisher's LSD. And both of these can only be applied when you first detected a difference with an ANOVA. But once you've detected that difference with an ANOVA, what these do is they rank all of your groups and they, they form subgroups. And they can say that system A and system B, well, those two we can't tell a difference between, so we're going to group them together. But system C, we can not only see a difference, but we um, are pretty confident saying that system C is, is worse performing than the group of A and B together. So um, these allow you to actually do your ranking. So an ANOVA plus a postdoc. That is the typical way we do it. But in simulation, um, sometimes the ANOVA is not quite ideal. Because ideally we'd like in a simulation is we run a little pilot study. And then that pilot study tells us how many more simulations of each system to run. And then we run um, a study after that. And so this is a sort of so-called sequential sampling approach. We sample from some simulations. And then we use the statistical analysis of those samples from the very few number of runs to decide how we're going to change our runs in the future and rerun them so that ultimately, over time, we end up actually making a strong inference, but we end up not needing to, to generate a whole lot of simulations because we can, can kind of adaptive about it along the way. Moreover, whereas an ANOVA um, will end up with a postdoc test, will end up giving you a full ranking of all the groups. A lot of times, as engineers, we don't care about how all the groups rank. We only want to know what's the best or the worst one. So if we're doing a design, we don't want to know what the best design is so that we can then implement that design. We don't actually really care that much. It's kind of academic to know that one design is slightly better than another and is slightly better than another. Like if the designs aren't the best, we just don't really care about them. And so given that we only want to find the best model, then it may be that, that an ANOVA with a post hoc test is overkill and we can do something that only detects the best model and, we, and it'll be more efficient that way because we end up not needing to maybe generate as much data. So along those lines, you can find a procedure which was put together actually by the authors of this textbook, this, this select the best procedure. And it's another ranking and selection procedure, but it, it works a little bit differently. So the goal here is to design a ranking and selection procedure um, such that the kind of um, null hypothesis is that whatever system it selects is not the best system. And if that's our null, then the error we would make is by selecting a system that is more than a specified distance away from the best. So, in other words, what we want to, when we say that we want, a, you know, we have one. 
with 95% confidence, we want the ranking and selection procedure to select the best system. What we're saying is that we don't know if the right system is going to be selected, but we have pretty good confidence, with 95% confidence, that the system that we select will be within epsilon in performance measure from the actual best system, whatever that system might be. 5% of the times, we'll end up selecting something that's farther away than epsilon, so it will be truly not the best. So that gives us, this is a little bit like statistical power or setting your half width dimension. We run some pilot studies in order to calculate effectively standard deviations. Then from those pilot studies, um, we are then able to, with K systems, um, able to determine uh, what, which systems we need to gather more data from and then after we gather more data from those, then we can pick one of those and be confident that it will be within epsilon of the actual best system. And hopefully it'll be the best system, but if it's within epsilon of the best system, then we're saying by our choice of epsilon that it may as well be the best because epsilon is so small that we actually really don't care that much if we're suboptimal or if it's under an epsilon bound. So how does this work? Uh, in the select the best procedure, you, again, you do your initial replications, calculate sample means and variances, and then you do a kind of like a Bonferroni. And so you set your alpha equal to your desired alpha divided by um, the number of pairwise combinations. So you do the k times k minus 1 over 2 here. So you you do, you're going to compare every system to every other system uh, using that conservative Bonferroni correction. And that will end up giving you a subset of those K systems that are clearly better than all of the other systems, but are unclear. It's unclear which system inside that subset is better. So, um, and you get that subset by basically calculating a bunch of these confidence intervals for every pair. So system A and system B, a confidence interval. Then ask, is zero in that confidence interval? If zero is um, to the right of that confidence interval, um, then you conclude that one of them's better. Um, if it's to the left, you conclude that the other one's better. If it's in the middle, you can't make a conclusion. So if you do that over and over again, then you'll end up building a set of systems that are clearly dominant, but you won't be able to tell the difference between them. And then with that set, then if you look in the book, they say for each one of those, they give you a formula that allows you to calculate how many more runs you need for that system or for all uh, systems in that subset. And then once you've run those new runs on this reduced number of models, you can just calculate means. You don't need the standard deviations anymore. And then you just select among that set according to the means. So you only actually do the statistical test once here. And this is what allows the, this test to keep its family level type 1 error rate to alpha, effectively the Bonferroni correction. But this is a modification to the Bonferroni that then allows us to select the best from the systems that come out of the Bonferroni being ambiguous. And so it sort of restores a little bit of the statistical power that you lose by taking the Bonferroni approach. And so in the end, the system you pick, uh, well, a system that is epsilon far from the best will be picked with probability alpha or less, and that's what we want. So that's one example of a select the best procedure for ranking and selection. Note that because we're using t-tests, we're using half widths to compare these systems to each other, then there is an underlying assumption here that our data are normally distributed and, uh, and independent. Not surprising. Okay. So before I give you the summary, why don't you pop back to Canvas and answer a couple of questions by that, and then I'm going to come back to the summary and, uh, and we'll finish out this set, and I'm going to add a few more extensions that I just want you to have some exposure to.